Do you own a car? Or have you ever drove a car? Or have you ever been in the car with someone while driving? Well, if answer is yes, continue watching video. If answer is no, still continue watching video as this has nothing to do with the cars but the trains. I'm just joking, but I talk about cars so you can easier understand the analogy. When you are in the car and you drive through curve, you will notice that there is some higher forces that push you aside if in, and if you don't steer and give a little gas, it will kick you out from the road or in the other lane. Well, that higher forces have names and they are called centripetal and centrifugal force. Centripetal force pulls the objects inside of the curved center. On the other side, centrifugal force pulls the object outside of, of curved center. Well, I guess that you assume that these two needs to be in some kind of balance, right? Well, what keeps you safe on the road is the friction created between surfaces, in this case, road surface and tires, when you steer the wheel. Power of centripetal force depends on how sharp you steer your wheel and how good is traction of your tires. On the other side, you have something called inertia that tries to pull you out of the road. And if you don't know what is inertia, I suggest you to read about one very cool guy called Isaac Newton and read about just three loves, especially the first one. But railways do not have a steering wheel, right? And friction between rail and wheel doesn't sound like high, right? So what do we do there? Well, first of all, rail and train wheel steel to steel connection is something that makes train locomotives easier to pull high masses. This is also called adhesion. More on that, what keeps train on track is construction of the train wheel, having this flange at one side of the, of the, of the wheel. This is literally what keeps train on the track. But having enormous masses on the track and low rolling throughout curves doesn't sound like a great idea, especially with higher speeds, but sometimes with too low speeds as well. So how train travel throughout curves safely? Here we come to the concept of super elevation on, or otherwise called railway track cant. In other words, elevating rails to compensate lateral forces. So before we continue, please note that not all railway curve have, curves have super elevation as it depends on curve radius and speed. Also, even more than that, note that not just railway curves have super elevation, but also something called clotoids that are also called transition curves in some countries. So how all this works together? Let's create one stretch of the railways having straight parts, clotoids and curves. Let's also see how formulas for centrifugal forces look like. So we can see that centrifugal force is directly proportional to mass and square of 10 tangential velocity while opposite proportional to radius. So higher speed and lower radius cause problems. How we compensate this? We do it by elevating outer rail of the track so that pressure on both wheels stays relatively the same. This state is also called Kant equilibrium. How we got to this equilibrium? Well, by elevating outer rail, we change center of train gravity, so resulting force has changed. You can probably understand that higher speeds require higher elevation, but not necessarily if track radius is large enough. And this all would be great, but in reality, it is not really like that. This is because we have different trains that run in different speeds. So we have to introduce some new terms such as applied count, count efficiency and count excess. They are all connected to each other, but they all came from theoretical count, which is calculated by following formula. So applied count is difference between theoretical count and count efficiency or sum of theoretical count and count excess. Why this is important? Well, because we have to know how much we can elevate our track. Don't forget that we have one more force in the curve, centripetal force. So we don't want to elevate our track in order to keep train from not sliding outside, 
the track and then have our train slide on the other side inside of the track so here is the example let's say we have train with maximum speed 150 kilometers per hour and curve radius 1700 meters theoretical count by formula is so that is theoretical count if there is always same speed on given curve we assume that equilibrium count is two-thirds of theoretical count this is 104 millimeters, which is equilibrium Kant. In this case, Kant deficiency is 52 millimeters, which is within regulations. If we assume that some freight trains are going through same curve with a speed of 80 kilometers per hour, theoretical Kant by previous formula would be only 44 millimeters and excess Kant would be 105 minus 44, which is 61 millimeters. This is fine as well, but I believe you get the point. With higher speeds, can deficiency is more important. With lower speed, can't excess gets more important. Now, there are some other aspects here that need to be understood, such as minimum curve radius, Kant gradient and Kant deficiency gradient, rate of change of Kant and similar. So if you find this interesting, I have amazing course in track design where you can learn all of this and much, much more in just four weeks. Beside this, there is also one other solution how to counterattack centrifugal force in curves and that is by tilting trains. This technology exists in few different countries but is best known for use on a high speed train X2000 in Sweden. As far as I know, there are also some similar trains running in Italy. That would be all for this video. Thank you for watching and please like, share and subscribe to my channel. Thank you very much and have a good day.